Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have everyone uh, again for uh, the seminar. So today we're about to have Pierre uh, give a talk on uh, quantum scars. Uh, Pierre is a PhD student now in my group. And, uh, you know, so recently, some of you may know, uh, um, we've been uncovering a lot of things about uh, ergodicity breaking in quantum mechanical systems. And, uh, you know, so quantum scars is sort of the next evolution of that. And Pierre's going to tell you more about that. And, uh, you know, he's really been on a mission to kind of unearth everything we know about these systems and uh, um, and and sort of produce very interesting results. So I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, go ahead, Pierre. Thank you, Katya, for this nice introduction. So um, today we'll be talking about quantum scars and their relations to formalism that we decided to call the broken uh, unitary formalism. And so this talk will really be in two parts. And the first part, it will really give a, an introduction of what quantum scars are in general. And then in the second part, I'll discuss some of our results that really try to relate these quantum scars to uh, what we call the broken picture. All right. So um, first, to understand quantum stars, it's useful to think about quantum formalization in general. And a good place to start is classical transition. And so the idea or the way we usually think about classical transition is this process where we have, say, a microstate that corresponds to a macroscopic state with low entropy. And then as time goes on, the state will kind of roll towards a, another microstate that, has, uh, that now corresponds to a macroscopic state with high entropy. And this just happens due to the sheer force of numbers and uh, the, the fundamental law of statical mechanics that is the statement that all of the microstates are equally probable. And so we are much, my, like, much more likely to find the system into a microstate that corresponds to high entropy state just, for the just because of the fact that there are much more ways to have this uniform gas and there are ways to have all the particles uh, of the gas be, being bunched up in one corner of the of the box here, right? And so um, now the, these equilibrium states, if we look at uh, their properties, such as say local uh, density of particle or local magnetization, these, these type of things will agree with the prediction of statistical mechanics. And this their average will just be the average over all the possible microstates that, that you know, satisfy the constraint of the system. And so here, what I want us to remember is that, well, equilibrium states, their, their macroscopic properties are uh, accurately described by just sceptical mechanics in general, right? This is how the everyday uh, world works. And so now what about quantum transition? Well, um, if we want to think about quantum transition, we can think of what are the steady states of quantum systems, right? And the steady states of quantum systems are its eigenstates. And so just like in the, the you know the classical world where, where, where the equilibrium states are expected to be accurately described by statistical mechanics, we also expect the steady states of quantum systems to also be accurately described by statistical mechanics. And so the way we make that precise is if we start measuring local observables, such as local particle density or local magnetization, these things should also agree with the prediction of statistical mechanics, just because, well, quantum mechanics is supposed to describe the, you know, the real world. And so if we say I have a classical system that we know thermalized and its quantum version, surely it will also uh, have eigenstates that, that, uh, that do the term, right? Um, otherwise we would have contradicting um, predictions from statistical mechanics and classical mechanics. And so the way we, we can really make this bridge between statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics, it turns out that it's not that, it's not that, that simple to do. And people have come up with a set of rules that if your quantum system satisfies them all, then you can for sure justify the use of statistical mechanics to describe the equilibrium properties of your, um, of your, of your system. So this is called the eigenstate transition hypothesis. And it, it's really there to make this bridge between quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, right? So I won't, uh, we don't need to go into the details of what the actual rules are, but what's important is that these exist. And now we can think about uh, when do we expect, you know, quantum system to formalize in general? Well, 
if we think about it, uh, this uh, quantum system should terminalize whenever we look at some uh, some symmetry sector of, of that endpoint. Why is that? Well, and, and why are symmetry sectors are actually important to consider when we try to understand conversation? Well, let's just, again, have this classical picture, say, of a gas, but now I have this impenetrable wall, right? Uh, and that adds a constraint on the dynamics of my system. And if I let this, this system time evolve, if, if, say, I don't take this constraint into account, then my prediction will be, as before, that the gas just reach this equilibrium uniform uh, distribution. However, we know this is not you know, the correct equilibrium state due, due to this restriction that we have, right? We have some constraint on the dynamics. And then Hamiltonians are essentially the same. When we have uh, conserved quantities, right, of Hamiltonian or symmetries, Correspond to the cancer quantities that restricts the, the way the system in time evolve. And that, uh, in the end, will, is essentially the equivalent of adding these restraints on the dynamics. And so the equilibrium state will, will, will must, must you know, follow these, these, uh, these constraints. And so once we've taken all of these things into account, all of these restrictions on how the system in time evolve, now we can accurately predict the equilibrium state. So, for instance, here we have this impenetrable wall. So the Actual, uh, you know, equilibrium state will just be the, the the you know the gas will just be uniform within its allowed volume, right? So now, once we've taken into account all of the symmetries, then people expect that you know statistical mechanics should apply and everything should just formalize within those within those constraints. And this is what people talk for a long time. And actually, I mean, if you, I mean, I would say ninety nine percent of the quantum system we know about actually do satisfy these types of uh, thermalization processes. However, we find that it's not, I mean, people have found actually that this is not the full story. And there are actually systems where even if you take into account all of those constraints, still you get anomalous dynamical properties and anomalous thermal properties. And these are really what, what quantum stars are. They are. There are cases where we expect the, the system to just thermalize and have you know steady states that are thermal and are apparently described by statistical mechanics, but somehow they don't. And yeah, that, that's that's really what quantum stars are. And so to see why this is quite jaw, jaw dropping and why and why really this is you know the, these type of properties are, are surprising, quantum stars really mean that there are steady states of your system that are not apparently described by statistical mechanics, and so things won't thermalize. And, and so you can have these type of things such as the following. Imagine your quantum state is in, in this uh, in, in, is in this dynamical of your state where half of it is hot and the other half is cold. Then if the ETH was satisfied, and we would expect that that to just go towards some sort of you know equilibrium state where everything is lukewarm. But because you have steady states now that are not described by statistical mechanics, things don't need to thermalize anymore. And you can remain into this non-equilibrium state essentially for a very long time and sometimes forever, which is you know completely you know so that, that's very surprising, right? But we actually uh, observe these type of things. And so quantum stars are these 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 special case where somehow systems don't thermalize, even though we have taken into account all of the constraints we could think about. Right. Um, and so this might seem far stretch. I mean, are there really quantum systems that do satisfy the, these types of behaviors? And it turns out that yes, they are. And that's what's nice with quantum stars is that, well, actually it's, you know, they have been found in experiments and then people have tried to understand them. So they, they really are a phenomenon that actually occur in nature. And so um, here I want to discuss some very nice experiments um, that study uh, one dimensional chain of Wittberg atoms. There are actually 51 of those atoms. And so let me just give the setup here. Each of these atoms is held in place by optical freezers. And each atom is effectively a two-level system. So it's either in its Rydberg state, aka its excited state, or in its ground state. And each of these atoms is then driven between those two states. Okay, so if I add all of the atoms very far away from each other, they will just trivially associate independently. When once I take them next to each other, when they are close enough, then when two atoms are both in their Rydberg states, their electron cloud starts to overlap, and this leads to van der Waal interactions. And now this model is, becomes interacting once the atoms are next to each other. 
right? And so once you take into account all of those symmetry sectors, as I was talking about before, you can predict that states such as the following. So what they did in this experiment is that they prepared the following state, Wittberg state, ground state, Wittberg state, ground state. Where here the the you know the the colors that are more, more bright orange means that you have a high probability of finding the atom in its Wittberg state, and the darker color means that you have a larger probability of finding the atom in its ground state. So they prepared this particular state, and then they let it time evolve. Right, and what happened is the is that is the following. So you start with this ordered state, and then it somehow reached this sort of you know sort of equilibrium state where everything seems you know uniform. But out of the blue, it somehow revives and become and becomes again an ordered state. And this happens for you know quite a quite a long period of time here. And this is quite unusual because people were were predicting that in this particular model. The state should just terminalize and you know never come back to some ordered state. This is the equivalent of what we had before. You know, this like having this copy mode where half of it is half of it is called. This is this initial ordered state, and then instead of just reaching equilibrium, it keeps it it keeps staying into this highly ordered state. Now, obviously, this might not be that surprising if you don't think about what are the time scales involved into the system. Maybe that's just some very golden rule thing happening. But as it turns out, if you look at the um, largest time scale for canonization in the system, then the time scale for the association is actually quite larger than this time scale for canonization. And so something else is preventing actual canonization for occurring in the system, um, which was really, uh, yeah, this was an experiment that really shook the community and really sparkled a lot of research and interesting research in trying to understand what is happening here. Okay. So that's an, an actual example of quantum stars. And the way we can analyze a little bit better this, this system is to try to, to find a, an effective model to describe the you know, dynamics of the system. And this model is called the, the PXP model. So let me just walk you through the Yamo comment here. So each local term is just this XI term sandwiched between two projectors. And these projectors are projectors onto the ground state of the Rydberg atom at site I. And then you have this excite term that uh, creates a transition between this Rydberg state and this ground state. Now, um, why, why, the, why, why is the anatomy of that form? Well, if you think about it, the only thing that can happen in a, in a model like this is if you have, say, uh, the, the, any given atom can only become uh, a rid, excited, excited, excited in its Rydberg state if both its neighbors are in its ground state, right? And so what's the, that means that the, this model can never create blockade excitations, right? And so we are working in the low energy subspace where there's never two Rydberg atoms next to each other. Okay, so this is the effective model that describes this, uh, this Rydberg atom, this, this Rydberg chain that we had. And now if we look at the eigenstate of that system, here it's plotted as a function of energy. Each of these dots corresponds to an I Yes? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, you, what you said is that in the actual paper, they describe these long range interactions in this model. And, yeah. So this, this actually depends on the actual spacing. You, so you can you can choose a spacing such, such that the only relevant interactions are only next to uh, nearest neighbors interactions. So depending on, on, how, on how close you make the lattice, then you get different, uh, actually, uh, you can choose different phase uh, and you know, you, you you might need to include now next to nearest neighbors interactions, but what we're looking at is only the case where only nearest neighbors interactions also so are relevant. This picture, yes, they generate near neighbor interactions. Yes. Okay. Yes, if I remember correctly, yes. Yes. So, so it's in the case where it's it's in the situation where only nearest neighbors interactions are are the relevant interactions, and this is why. But this model is that it actually makes sense in this particular case. Uh, okay, so this is our PXP model, and now what we, as I said, we can we can look at the eigenstates of that particular model, which are all of these blue dots here. Here it's plotted as a function of energy, and on the y-axis we have an overlap of these eigenstates with this initial nail state that we that we considered. And what we're finding is this very very weird picture where it seems like 
there are a lot of states, right, these, um, these black dots that actually have a high overlap with the nail state. And the reason why this is surprising is that once we've taken into account all of the, you know, the symmetries of the model and all the restrictions, then all of these allowed computational basis states that don't have any of those blockades, technically there, there's no reason to prefer one of these computational states rather than the other. And so observing I overlap for these eigenstates is essentially saying that I have a steady state that somehow have more weight in one particular state than the others, even though this shouldn't happen. It's, it's the equivalent of having, say, again, this coffee mug where half of it is hot and half of it is cold. And when I let it equilibrate, somehow the equilibrium state still has a gradient in temperature. It doesn't thermalize fully. And so that's essentially what we're seeing here, which was quite surprising. And really, that's an example of quantum stars. You get all of these equilibrium states of your system that somehow are not you know, accurately predicted by subtle mechanics. They, they have larger weight in certain states for some reason. So the question was, um, what are these uh, Xs? What, what is this FSA? Uh, what does this FSA represent here in this uh, in this model? And the answer was, this is a numerical method that, that we're able to use to approximate the, the quantum stars in this model. Okay. Uh, now, okay, so this concludes the first part of, of my talk. So these are quantum stars. These are these anomalous steady states of Hamiltonians that do not satisfy the, you know, the that do not seem to, to agree with statistical mechanics. Now, uh, I want to talk about our research, and I'll try to walk you through our the, the different ideas we had that eventually led to where we are now with this broken unitary picture. So the first idea was, well, okay, when we look at quantum stars, what do we see? We see that yeah, there are these highly ordered states that seem to time evolve into a really, really regular fashion, right? This nail state seems to evolve to another nail state and then comes back to itself. So maybe we can think about quantum systems that kind of naturally have all of these nice properties, these things, these properties where the states tend to revive to themselves. And then from these systems, try to extract Hamiltonians that will have similar, um, similar dynamical properties that seems to violate pneumocystical uh, mechanics. And um, this is an example. So, so the, this, the, the, the type of system that we wanted to consider are quantum cellular automata, but here again, it's, it's useful to think first about the classical setting. And so what is a classical cellular automata? Uh, we can think of it as follows. It's just a chain of cells, and each of these cells can take on a discrete number of values. In this particular case, we're considering a, you know, a chain where each cell can either be in the zero state or the one state. And then we have a, a set of rules that are there to update each cell depending on the state of its neighbors. And so what we're seeing on the screen here is an example of this. So this, this, um, this chain of cells and then the, the middle cell is initiated in the state one. And then as time goes on, we get this uh, very, uh, very nice structure that emerged. So this is classical cellular automata in, in a nutshell. And then we can think about what what, can we build quantum cellular automata that will ask some all similar features, right? And the, the, what, what it is is as follows. Um, first, in the quantum setting, the, the time evolution step needs to be a quantum, uh, you know, uh, it needs to be a unitary operator. That's the first requirement. And then uh, if you want to have like this, these, these sort of orbits or um, very, very structured um, time evolution, we can ask the unitary unit that compose this two-layer circuit that we have on screen to be some sort of permutation on the computational basis states of the past. Now, again, also the, the cells are now replaced by quantum systems, and we can think of them as qubit, right? So either a zero or one or superposition of both. Now, this unitary here, uh, as we can see, uh, simply permutes the computational basis states. It doesn't create superpositions. It's really essentially just a classical, in some sense, unitary, even though now we're describing a quantum system. All right, so this is this is the this is, this is model. And now because the local unitary are permutations, then the two layer circuit, since it's built from permutations, is also an entire permutation on the full interspace, right? And that means that whenever this circuit acts on, say, a given string of zero and one, 
then that will be mapped to another given string and so on and so forth. And since it's a permutation, eventually everything needs to come back to itself, right? And now we have this picture of you know all these orbits that that come that comes in. And so we can think of all of these little dots as just being a computational basis state. And then these 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 states just go on on in, in a journey along this orbit and then eventually come back to themselves. And so here in the, these type of systems, well, nothing seems to formalize. Whenever I start with a state, instead of just going to to uh, going to evolve to a random soup of quantum states, it somehow just keeps reviving and, uh, and, and, and writing along this periodic orbit. Now, the, the, the key question is, all right, clearly this system seems to violate, at, 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 at some extent, the eigenstate transition hypothesis. Can we somehow extract Hamiltonians from these systems and somehow preserve some of these non-thermal properties? That's really the, the goal, or, or, or really was our first idea. Um, and so the first thing we, we, we can, we can the, the, the way we try to do that is as follows. So the first layer of the circuit, right, is a product of those decoupled unitary gates. And we can always represent a unitary as being the matrix exponential of some Hamiltonian. So this A here will be the sum over local Hamiltonian terms that, uh, that essentially will be non-overlapping because the unitaries of the first layer are non-overlapping. And similarly, we can do the same thing with the second layer. Now, uh, A, as I said, will say E will be a sum over the even uh, local H naught, and B will be a sum over uh, the odd local Hamiltonians, where these H naught will just be uh, I times the log of the unitary, such that when we take the exponential, we just get back the unitary, right? So this will be the, this is the, the sort of system that we have. And now, our goal is to do the following. We want that A plus B, the, the Hamiltonian, the interacting Hamiltonian corresponding to the sum of the A terms plus the B term, somehow as time evolution for a given state that is the same as the original Floquet circuit, all right? So uh, hopefully this is clear. So the, the, the way to do that was to actually, um, ensure that arbitrary powers of the A Hamiltonian and arbitrary powers of the B Hamiltonian commute when they act on a given state. So let me re um, rephrase that. Um, we, want to we want to find a state psi such that the time evolution from the A plus B Hamiltonian gives us exactly the same thing as the original Floquet circuit, right? Okay, and it turns out that the rules that we need to satisfy is that arbitrary powers of A and B need to commute when they act on a given state. And what's important to realize here is that these rules, they only need to be true for a given state, right? They, they don't need to be true on the entire open space. So I'm not asking for A and B to commute here. We're not asking for novel symmetries to be implemented. We're asking for symmetries to be satisfied within a given subspace of the Hamiltonian. And that's really like kind of the key feature here. We're no more trying to understand dynamics of quantum system and through, through the, the actual global symmetries of the, of the entire world space. Now we're, we are really trying to understand, well, maybe subspaces have different constraints than the entire Hilbert space, right? Okay, so, uh, so the question was, um, um, Obviously, this will work if psi is, is, a, is a common eigenstate of both A and B. Uh, but uh, it, are, are these uh, restrictions actually that restricted? Well, it turns out that uh, your, your idea is completely right. Uh, it will turn out that psi will be a superposition of common eigenstates of A and B. It doesn't need to be a common eigenstate, but it will in, end up being a common eigenstate of both. And what's, what's nice here is that, well, Usually when we think of two non-commuting operators, we think, well, there, I cannot find you know, common eigenstate of those, of, those, of those systems. Or actually I cannot diagonize the full Hamiltonian simultaneously. But that doesn't mean that there doesn't exist subspaces where actually you can find common eigenstates of both operators. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We we're saying that you have these non-commuting operators. They do not commute in general. So you cannot simultaneously diagonize them on, on the entire over space. Maybe this works on a restricted subspace. All right. Um, and the existence of that restricted subspace 
the origin of the spark. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the, the yeah. So the origin. Yeah, I should say that indeed. So the 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 origin or the existence of that 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 restricted subspace uh, of common eigenstates will actually lead to these quantum structs. So the anomalous eigenstates that will be common eigenstates of ND will correspond to the scarring states in general, as we'll see uh, for people. Okay, so uh, the, these rules on A and B can actually be simplified further in terms of local terms or local conditions. Uh, and so, for instance, you can either think of local conditions in terms of the original unitaries that you had in your, if you had in your, in your, in your full case unitary, or you can think of them uh, directly in terms of the log of the of the of the unitary case you know. And so you get this this following structure. So you, you choose your state uh, that we call here the the orbit state, and then provided it satisfies these rules that are on screen. So you have this configuration of unitary gate, where if, you know each each unitary is is raised to some arbitrary integer power a, b, and c. As long as you can interchange this configuration and and and, and gives you the same exact result. If this is true for arbitrary integers, then you will add that the original rules that we add will be satisfied. And so if this thing works locally, you can guarantee that the Hamiltonian A plus B will produce dynamics that is the same as the Floquet unit. And so now this theory creates, you know, this can, this can give rise to some very peculiar states that some all time evolve in time and never thermalize uh, uh, due to these rules. Okay. So uh, and now I just want to discuss some examples that we were able to, to find. And so uh, what we did is then it turns out that these rules, you can count them. They are not infinite. So even though I said arbitrary powers, uh, it turns out that eventually things seem to close up on themselves and you can, you can count the total number of rules you have. And when we look at uh, the different models that satisfy an increasing number of these rules, we find that the revivals or the, the unusual dynamics seems to become stronger and stronger. And so we show that here. So uh, on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis, it's essentially just a measure of how strong the revivals are. And when we see, we see that when we satisfy a, a, a small number of rules, it seems like the revivals are quite erratic. But as we increase the number of rules, to all the rules satisfied, then we get perfect revivals, right? So the, the stage just comes back to itself perfectly in time. And so this, this was an example of a system where this behavior cannot be understood through the through normal symmetries. Now it's really that we have a subspace where somehow these rules apply, and now the, the dynamics is described by this flow k unitary instead of being described by usual quantum dynamics, right? And so this was already a, a nice a nice result. Happy with that, and then uh, this gave us the following idea: Can we can we try to continue and generalize what we found to to try to see if we can include more models into our constructions? So remember that our previous rules were the following, right? We have this a and b term, and we ask for arbitrary powers of them to commute on a given subspace of state psi, and we so, we we showed or we, I discussed our yeah, I said that, you can believe me, that um, then the time evolution of the full Hamiltonian A plus B will be the same as the time evolution of the, the Floquet unitary. Now, this, this leads us to the, the following generalization or just the Floquet unitary approach. Can we now think about just Hamiltonians that are built of simple terms? Well, I, I will I will, uh, precise, I will, I will, I will try to be more precise about what I mean by simple. But say, say you have a, a given Hamilton H that you can decompose, say, into its sum A plus B plus C, where say A is a sum of uh, decoupled local terms, right? So what I mean by simple is that I can find their eigenstates and eigenvalues quite easily, for instance. Now, given an Hamilton like this, can we find states such that when I apply this full, uh, this whole time evolution of my entire Hamiltonian, can I decompose that or break that, right, into a product of simpler time evolution? And since I said that each of these terms, A, B, C, and so on and so forth, are quite simple, then in principle, the time evolution of that particular state, instead of being thermalizing, will now be described by something that's much simpler. OK, so that's the working engineering approach. Lead this makes sense. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. OK, so 
Uh, now, yeah. So the question was, uh, was uh, you know, what what are the conditions on these operators so such that you get uh, quantum revivals or perfect revivals? And in, in the end, uh, this will be ensured, for instance, if all the operators that we have here say have equid equidistant energies, right? And so as as uh, the, these these these, uh, these operators themselves, e to the minus i a t will actually uh, eventually come back on themselves. And so this will naturally lead to quantum revivals. All right, so now we, we wanna discuss some specific cases where maybe we can apply this broken unitary picture and try to find conditions that will ensure that this broken unitary approach uh, indeed works out. So first let's consider the, the following case where we have say a Hamiltonian, but there's a sum of arbitrary superposition bi times hi. So the bi are random coefficients here and hi uh, is, a, is, is a local operator that has support on a neighborhood of the site i. And to that, we add a sum over bi terms and the bi are single site operators, okay? Now, the broken in three picture here, what we would like is that the time evolution from the full Hamiltonian h should be only described by this, the, the, the unitary operator uh, of the single site operators. And so clearly if we have this property here, then the time evolution would be much simpler than the actual full time evolution given by H, right? We are completely removing the terms that overlap and describing the time evolution from something that's fully decoupled. So can we, can we find rules that will ensure that this will be the case? As it turns out, they are, and they are not too, too, too difficult to, they're not, they're not too complicated. All, all we have to do is to, to do is to have that the H I term, when we look at the, the action on the sum over the V I terms that overlap with the, with the, with the support of H I, and they take that thing to some power A that is arbitrary. And then we act with this on the state psi S, which is a given state of our system. If this is zero for all possible integer A, then we can actually show that this is sufficient to ensure that the dynamics will be uh, described by only this V term. And so that gives us a very nice, simple set of rules that if our R, that, that, that if are satisfied, will produce the unusual uh, time evolution. Right. And as it turns out, there are a lot of examples of quantum stars that actually uh, these exact constraints. So the Auburn model is known for its adopting against um, sparse states. And so here in this particular model, the, the opting terms are, are actually the HI and the local interaction term plus the chemical potential, which are single site operators, uh, actually corresponds to the sum over IVI. And then you can show that for the eta pairing states, uh, these states actually follow the conditions that I highlighted above, uh, which means that the time evolution will only be described by these local, the, the sum of local terms, which uh, consequently leads to uh, perfect revivals. Again, uh, there's another example. In the spin one XY model, you get this, uh, essentially these up in terms between spins. Uh, these can be associated again with the HI, and then we get local magnetization terms that can be associated with the I, and this model also satisfies uh, the other rules. And what we have here is examples where when we look at these Hamiltonians with all the terms together, these are expected within their symmetry sectors to fully thermalize. But using our construction, we can show that there exists a subspace of states that are somehow time evolved according to a different time evolution, right? That's, what, that's, that's the idea here. And yeah. can you make this more concrete? Like if I look at the XY model, for example, yeah. well, just show which commutation relations uh you know take a state. Yeah. Uh, so so what you would what you would what you would do is you first say pick SI HJ plus HJ HI. This would be your HI. Huh? Right. Then what you do is you look at the sum over the VI over uh, that have that have, that have you know support that, that overlaps sorry with this HI. So this would have this would be SIZ plus SGZ plus SIZ squared plus SGZ squared. Right? And then you would take take that and take some power of it and then apply it on any given state and then apply this HI on it. 
the, the, the question is, uh, is could, could you give a concrete example of, um, of a case, uh, for, for instance, states where this will, where this, where, where this will work? Example of states that would do that uh, is, the, is as follows. So you have some creation operator, your dagger, that acts on, say, your um, yeah. eraser. So here, this is a spin one model, right? So each a given uh, individual uh, site can either be, uh, uh, you know, in a spin in a spin minus one, zero, or one state where these are just the uh, eigenvalues of the SZ operator. Right? Now we want to create states that may might, might satisfy these conditions. So let me write down the Hamiltonian. So we have sum over all possible neighbors psi j, psi x. X plus S I Y S G Y plus H sum over I S I Z plus uh, D sum over I S I Z squared. Right. So now this creation operator, it it it, um, it turns out that in the spin one X Y model, the scar states uh, correspond with a Q dagger that looks like this. So it's a Q dagger is the sum over j of minus one to the j times s uh, j plus squared. Okay, so these are the scar states and you apply this Q dagger on this state, it gives you uh, another state, so on and so forth. And these will correspond to eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that violate the ETH. The question is then, why do these states violate the ETH, right? That, that's what we're trying to answer. And now what we'll show is that these particular states follow the rules that I highlighted above. Okay, so this is the scar states. And now we will prove that these scar states have this you know, restricted time evolution. So to do that, what you do is you, you, you know, one of the local terms of your Hamiltonian. So here that would be S I X S J X plus S I Y S J Y. Take this, this is this hi. And then we then uh, take a sum over the vi that overlap with this. So this will be uh, h s i z plus h s g z plus d s i z squared plus d s g z squared. And yeah, maybe you cannot see. Um, okay, you take this thing to some power and then you apply it on the star states, okay? And then you ask the question, is that zero for, for all possible powers? If that is zero, then that shows that these states actually correspond to a subspace that is described by this restricted time evolution. So that's really hard there is to it. So you. Whenever you find a state that will satisfy those rules, you can ensure that its time evolution will be described by this restricted time evolution. So essentially, this means that you can forget about the opting terms in through your Hamiltonian, and the only relevant dynamical features come from these local mag mag uh, magnetic terms, right? So everything just simplifies. You have all of this interaction, very complicated interaction that usually leads to parameterization. That all goes away if the rules are satisfied. And then the only relevant terms in your Hamiltonian become these local magnetic terms, right. which is quite an, um, and you know, this cannot be explained using usual symmetries, uh, which is, uh, yeah, basically quantum scars are, I, I'm, I'm, essentially this, 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 uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, is this thinking that only the symmetries matter for the restricted time evolution, but actually you, you should also think about subspaces where other symmetries might apply. All right, so now uh, I'll turn to uh, a second class of, uh, of, uh, of rules that we can devise to get these uh, quantum yeah, scars. Okay. Um, all right, so the first thing we, we uh, need to do for this second class of quantum scars is to define first a partition. And what I mean by partition here is just, we have a Hamiltonian that we write down as a superposition of operators OA, where these OA are built out of local terms that first, uh, First, do not interact, so they, they are essentially non-overlapping. 
but that cover the entire set of sites. And so I'm just going to give an example here. Imagine I have a Hamiltonian that is built out of two site operators. So this will be uh, this will be my initial Hamiltonian, and then a partition of it would be say to only pick the even sites or the odd sites, right? And now my O1 plus O2, when I add them together, will give me back my original Hamiltonian. Now the the set of rules I will devise is to try to find states that essentially will be described. Following broken, I'm just going to skip already this part. So I'm, we, we're going to try to find uh, states psi L that are described by you know a broken product of these OER operators. That will be the goal. Okay. So uh, this formalism works best to uh, when understood as um, when understood uh, when applied to uh, MPS states. So I'm going to try to quickly uh, uh, review what MPS are, but so the uh, MPS state can be thought of as, you know, representing a quantum state uh, encoded with matrices where each ma there, there's, there's a matrix associated with each site and each spin for that local, local, that local site. And then the coefficient in front of my state is just the product of all of those matrices and then traced over, provided we have fairly continuous conditions. Okay, so that's an MPS state. And then what we want to do is, like I discussed a little bit here, we, we the creation operator that will act on this base state and create excitations. And these are the states that we will want to, you know, satisfy this broken into the picture. Okay, so we start with a base state. We have a creation operator that essentially replaces these A matrices with B matrices. Uh, and this, this creates an excited state and we want those particular excited states to satisfy a given set of rules that will ensure that we get this broken unitary. Okay, uh, and the one last thing that we, we need to think about is how do we think about subparts of an NPS state? Well, you just to, to, to describe, say, the, um, an NPS state from site A to I plus state, what you do is you just write down the sum, now it's untraced, and essentially you have a vector associated with each matrices, uh, each product of matrices that, that um, that appear in this range I to I to state. There's a type of it should be I to state. Okay. Um, and we represent that by this. So, so far, the only thing I've said is, well, we have MPS state as base state. We create excitations from them, and then we want to look at parts of those states. Okay. Um, and now the broken unitary picture will be uh, the following goal. We want, to find, we want that these excited states to be described by this broken unitary. So instead of having the full monotone and describing the time evolution, now it's only a product over these uh, these decoupled time evolution operators. Uh, to do that, there's another set of rules that we can find that are actually quite similar to what we had before. So each of these OIA terms that appear in each of those terms OA, um, the uh, when 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 I add when, again when I act with this on these creation operators. Uh, to raise to some power n and then apply this on the local wave function. As long as this essentially is an eigenstate of this whole operation, then I can ensure that I will obtain this dynamical decoupling. So this might seem a little bit convoluted, and indeed, these rules are a little bit more can be tedious to, to apply, but once used to it, they, they are actually quite simple because everything is inherently local, right? I'm having fully local properties that leads to this entire decoupling of global operators. And as it turns out, these types of rules also can be used to um, understand quantum scars, the other models. So for instance, there's this spin one AKLT model that satisfies those rules. And so the spin one AKLT model is a model described by this sum over projectors. Each of these projectors are uh, act on two sites and project any two spin one configuration into the total spin two configuration. And now we can decompose this HAKLT into two partition, the sum over the projectors on the odd sites and the sum over the projectors on the even sites, a bit like the picture I've, uh, I've showed before. And you can show that these two rules satisfy uh, the, the rules I, I showed above um, for some given states. And so you can, you can find quantum stars in this model using this broken unitary picture. There's actually another model um, uh, that, that actually also satisfies this, this same property, a bit more complicated, so it has these four terms. And 
quantum stars again can be showed using um, uh, using these uh, these particle theories. All right. So uh, this this essentially concludes this presentation. So I'm just gonna summarize a little bit uh, what we saw. So um, first we saw that we can relate um, you know these simple time evolution of local unitary uh, these quantum solar automata to Hamiltonians. Uh, and, and, and try to add these Hamiltonians to teach some of these non thermal properties of these quantum solar automata by having these local rules, right? So we have these local rules on the unitary gates or on the uh, local Hamiltonians. And if all those rules were satisfied, we are able to obtain unusual time evolution. Afterward, we, we, uh, I mean, we saw that this is really the result of the existence of subspace where the partitions A and B actually commuted, right? Arbitrary powers of A and B commuted when acting on these specific uh, subspaces. And that was really why the, the quantum stars existed in Pluto, subspace, uh, in Pluto systems. And then we generalized this idea to this broken entry picture. So now instead of you know, relying on this underlying flow automata, we just went over that and Try to understand when do you know general Hamiltonians with multiple terms just decoupled into simpler time evolution operators? And what we found is that you can find strictly local rules that can lead to this, type, and that's not directly related to usual symmetries of the Hamilton. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. And the question is: uh, Do these quantum stars are stable under perturbations? In general, or are they just some sort of accidents? Um, as far as I'm aware, there are some quantum stars that, so it, it depends. So there, sometimes there are some perturbations that you can add that, will, that won't break necessarily the area of quantum stars. But in general, uh, if you add some sort of arbitrary perturbation to your Hamiltonian, then you will break this specific star subspace due to the fact that these rules that we add will not be satisfied anymore in general. So you cannot necessarily perturb as you want your Hamiltonian, but there are some perturbations that can protect you know, the quantum stars. But you could you could think that at them as yes, indeed, at the accidents of nature where you indeed get these rules satisfied on a given subspace. Um, so yeah, the question is: Are our quantum stars really uh, that realistic? Well, as we saw, there are actually quantum, actual quantum systems like the Lindbergh model that actually do have these quantum stars. So I mean, to, as far as we know, quantum stars can still exist uh, in nature. So they are indeed, you, you can think of them as indeed being actually robust uh, in certain places. Um, yeah. But you, yeah, as soon as you would have some, you know, really damaging perturbations, then yes, uh, these quantum stars would, would go away. But if you have a very well controlled system in a the lab, then you might still get, be able to get these quantum stars. Yeah, so the question is, in the PXP model, it seems like their revivals were not uh, perfect. Does that mean that only a certain number of rules are satisfied? Yes, indeed. That's, that's exactly, uh, well, that's the way we interpret it. Um, if you can actually relate the PXP model to some automata, and then kind of through this procedure, you can relate this automata to the PXP model. And it turns out that PXP model satisfies a good amount of these rules, but not all of them. And so, this might be used to understand why exactly why you get approximate quantum stars. One big open question, though, uh, that we still have is how do you actually, you know, precisely corroborate the number of rules that are satisfied with the actual strength of the revivals and the actual decay? Something that we're still still trying to think about and figure out. Yeah. So uh, the question is: Are are all the rules are equally important, or is there some sort of hierarchy? Uh, there's a clear hierarchy when you think about the Hamiltonian rules, because if you think of a BCH expansion, uh, what you'll get is some terms that will be multiplied by T squared and T cubed and so on. And so you can try to satisfy the rules for the lowest order before trying to satisfy the lar largest order. And so in this sense, you get some sort of hierarchy of which rules to, to satisfy first. But uh, in the unitary picture, it turns out that it's much, complicated, much more complicated because the unitaries appear at all orders simultaneously. And so uh, for that reason, um, yeah, uh, it, there's a clear hierarchy in the Hamiltonian picture, but not necessarily in the unitary one. So uh, I'm asking, I'm standing close to here to ask this question. Yeah. Um, so um, 
Yeah, you, you showed these local rules, right? I mean, presumably, I mean, there's two questions. Can you relate them to some kind of usual approaches to integrability? Mm -hmm. But, you know, like gang backs with everything. Yeah, that's done. And the other thing is, I mean, are, I mean, can you form more non local, you know, as opposed to this very local rule? Because, I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I mean, you can probably prove from the local rules yeah. that the global rules are satisfied, but it's not necessarily the case in the opposite direction. Yeah, right? that's correct. So that's a good point. Uh, indeed, the, the local rules, uh, they are they they are they ensure that the global rules on the A and B operators are satisfied. So you can think of if so uh, indeed. So you were you were saying are are there more global rules? Yes, yes, there are the. If you think about this, this, this commuting uh, arbitrary, so the, the original rules are, are, are this, you know, the arbitrary powers of A and arbitrary powers of B need to commute uh, with each other when they act on the full step psi. And these are inherently global because they include all of the, the, the terms in the Hamiltonian. Now, it turns out that you can simplify these rules by coming up with these local rules, but what happens is that they are not equivalent, right? If you satisfy the local rules, you can show that the global rules will be satisfied, but maybe some more interesting physics happens in the global setting. It's just that they are much more harder to use in general. So at some point you need to do some trade up and really what we wanted to, to do is try to find these models that add these quantum stars. And so it was easier to just try to come up with these, uh, these local rules. Now, uh, that's another great question, are these, um, are these rules related to some uh, integrality, integrality conditions like in the yang baxter equations? We suspect that there is, but we have not yet totally investigated that particular uh, question. Um, that, that's a good point. I mean, yes, we, this, is, this is definitely something that we need to look more into and try to, to figure out if there's really this connection between the integrality and the rules we come up with. There's prob there probably is, but but it's now a question about maybe integrality over a restricted subspace, things like that that we that we need to think about more. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was very nice. I, my question is just: uh, what fraction of the full Hilbert space do your states uh, occupy, and what would happen in the thermodynamic limit? Would you mm -hmm. would they be? Uh, yeah, that's of the you know zero measure or mm -hmm. that's a that's a great question. Uh, it, uh, yes, oh yes, of course. Uh, the question was, um, uh, you know, uh, how does these the scars of space scale in general? Do they do they you know do they vanish in the thermodynamic limit like, compared to the full the size of the Hilbert space? That's a, that's an excellent question. It turns out that it depends. You can have you can have. Um, you can have subspaces of scar states that actually scale, um, you know, exponentially with system size. And so when, uh, well, yeah, so, so yeah, so you, you can have all sort of varying uh, size for the scar subspace. Sometimes they scale poly polynomially with the system size. Sometimes, sometimes they can also scale exponentially. Sometimes they can even be a single site, a single uh, a state. So it really actually depends on uh, the actual Hamiltonian you have at hand. So many, many things can happen actually. Uh, um, yeah, and and uh, follow follow up question is uh, how sensitive are there are, are they to uh, uh, environmental perturbations? I mean, to small perturbations. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is how 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 uh, you know how, how stable are these quantum scars under these uh, under specific perturbations? Well, whenever you start adding uh, perturbations to your to your Hamiltonian, then you can essentially characterize the leakage out of your Scars of space using usual terms golden rule, and so they will they will start decaying as soon as you start adding these uh, these sort of perturbations. And so, um, you know, yeah. So that's that's yeah. I mean, yeah. So the question is, is is it also what we see in the quantum uh, in, for the PXP model? The PXP model is a bit yeah. The experiment. The experiment, yeah. For the experiment in the PXP model, uh, well, yeah. But, but I mean, just if we think of the PXP model itself, the revivals are not perfect. So the, the star towers that we have are not exactly equidistant. Uh, and so the model that, you know, the, the model that should have these exact stars by itself is already showing these sort of slowly decaying um, associations. 
and so in the, in the actual experiment, you know, the, the fact that these revivals are not perfect can actually from the actual theoretical model. Uh, so I would, I'm not, I would not be a hundred, I wouldn't say that the decay are actually only due to uh, perturbations, uh, environmental perturbations that can actually come from the actual theory that describes the model. Yeah, there are no more questions. Let's thank Pierre again for the nice talk.